So I want to start off this conversation by thanking you, Zana and Jennifer, for joining me here today. And thank you to Fall for the Book for bringing us together to host this conversation and numerous other conversations over the past 25 years. Mm-hmm. Jennifer Groats, your book, Still Falling, was published by Grey Wolf Press and released this past May. You are the author of Window Left Open and the award-winning author of two previous poetry collections, The Needle and Cusp. Your poetry has appeared in The New Republic, The New Yorker, and Best American Poetry, and you teach at the University of Rochester. Zena Azam, your debut book, Some Things Never Leave You, was just released from Tiger Bark Press in July. You are a Palestinian American poet, writer, editor, and community activist. You are the poet laureate of the city of Alexandria, Virginia for 2022 to 2025. And your works can also be found in art gallery catalogs and on public buses in the cities of Alexandria and Arlington, Virginia. We wanted to bring these two poets and their new books into conversation today because while they differ in tone, they have a similar overarching theme of grief and the exploration of not only grief, but intimate observations about the end moments of life. I was wondering if you would both read a poem for me before we jump into this conversation. So if we could, I wanna start with Zaina. Would you read, you could tell yourself for us? Yes, thank you so much, Danny. And thank you to follow for the book for hosting us today and having this conversation. It's really lovely to be with you and with Jennifer. Um, I wrote this poem right after my mother passed away, and um, I had just um, come into the room, and she had she has passed, and um, I had a lot of emotions about it. So this is the poem. It's called "You Could Tell Yourself." You could tell yourself almost anything that when you look at your mother on her deathbed, you say, well, she had a full life. You see that her diaphragm is no longer rising from a sacrum once rife with life. It makes you wonder about her final breath. Is it still in the room? And can you breathe it in to carry it in your veins? You know that her favorite blouse is scissored open in the back for easy dressing, and it makes you consider which of your own clothes you will die in, which ones will be given away to strangers. You could tell yourself that these are ephemeral things, that living to the fullest is what is important, and then you think, and then you ask, what does that mean? There are songs on the shelf that makes your tears flow, books that tell you of journeys toward an inner heaven or one beyond. There are the good deeds that maybe made someone's life better. Then there is this love that overwhelms you for her, for your brother who with you is the only one left, for your children who who you are terrified might also die before you. It sits heavily like the thick roots of an old tree, its high branches and leaves trying to fly. You want to believe this love has a lightness like that too, that it will fly and last beyond your physical body and hers, that people remember the dead this way, despite the dark absence. You could believe it. And then you think of your mother on her deathbed And you realize you do, that nothing is as important as loving, even if you cannot touch your loved ones after they die. You could then tell yourself that there are unnameable, invisible hands that will continue to open, close, flutter like leaves between you and your mother, and that maybe with the photographs and the memories that come when you close your eyes, that this is really all there is. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Zana. I especially love the moment where you wonder whether or not her last breath is in the room. Um, That really resonates. But all right. Thank you so much. And Jennifer, if you don't mind, would you read Free Fall for us? 
Um, yes, I'd be happy to. And Zaina, that was very moving. Um, thank you. Uh, my poem is also about a mother, <laughs> my mother, um, and it's called Free Fall. She was in a coma, the doctor told me over the phone. Her electrolytes out of whack. That was the literal. While I was on another continent, standing on a cliff, looking down at the sublime view my new friend had brought me to see, that was literal too. The glittering sea and the harbor with tiny boats lined up like teeth. Below us, cypresses jutted from the cliff's red rock. I couldn't understand how a person, a consciousness, was a kind of invention, provisional, and could be erased by glucose and potassium spilling through cell walls. That was what I was thinking as we stood in the small crowd that had gathered to watch the sunset. I marveled at the loss in store. Though I saw the beauty, a sky stained every color but green, a slow liminal glower stretching flat and thin as settling smoke, a horizon, a horizon and a unit of time. Let us go then, you and I, while she, I shuddered, was a patient etherized upon a table. Then I shuddered again as the man standing next to us jumped and fell and kept falling. Terror bloomed, then his parachute, then the literal and figurative reordered, then what we'd reached for instinctively in the moment of falling, then wordlessly we let go of each other's hand. Mm. So, <laughs> all right, that was uh, another incredible poem. And I, you know, I really um, found myself moved by both of these poems while I was reading them, especially since I have, you know, recently experienced the loss of my father. Mm -hmm. um, I really was in intrigued by the way that you both are pinpointing very different, but very uh, intricate parts of those last moments of, of life. Um, and so I wondered, uh, in free fall and in you could tell yourself, uh, both poems contemplate the end moments of life and the early moments of loss in really beautiful ways. Could each of you speak to the challenges of writing poems filled with such deep meditations on mortality? Hmm. Um, you know, um, free fall is one of the many um, falling poems and this what my book is called still falling and it's really a whole book about different kinds of grief um, and different and when one is and has the occasion to write several poems about several griefs one begins to see different strategies or mom not strategies but moments in the process and I was say what to me what's sort of unusual or what felt unusual when I started to write Free Fall was that it wasn't actually the moment of death. Although I think you're really right, Danny, that in both of our poems, the moment of death is, is looming. Um, I think in Zaina's poem, it's just happened. And in mine, the, the speaker's preparing herself, I think in a way. Um, and the, there's something that's suddenly got, registering something that's gone terribly wrong about the world. and. For me, I think that was one of the strangest moments of my whole life, because it's a very autobiographical poem of, of hearing, you know, T.S. Eliot's simile come to my head, um, sort of out of the blue. I, it's a, it's a, a lines I've quoted out loud most of my life. They're lines, that I, they're, it's one of the most famous metaphors in, in um, American literature, but to, for it to, to surface, when it was not figurative language at all, suddenly it was it was literal. I, there was a literal sense that there was a literal patient etherized upon the table, and that was my mother. Um, and it was as if, and then also the coincidence of this man jumping off the cliff. Um, it 
it it it did signify a kind of end moment, but it was like the world was giving me this material to help me process it. Um, and I think what's also very strange, I mean, I, I don't really understand that poem, to be honest, but it's important to me and I'm I'm flattered that you asked me to read it. Um, but it's hard, yeah, I, I think it's really, um, it's hard to think of, a, of writing a poem of grief like that when the person is so far away and not at the deathbed too. So um, I don't think I've answered your question, but I've at least maybe given Zena some time. <laughs> Well, I, um, yeah, thank you for starting the conversation on, about this, Jennifer. It, just being so close to that finality of my mother dying was such, um, was such a, a moment, like a revelation that everything is a question, you know, what does it mean that she's lived a long life. I mean, she was 95. But what does that really mean? You know, it's just everything to me became a question. I didn't, nothing, I had no touchstones anymore. And I started really probing, you know, how am I feeling? What does it mean that somebody ends? Um, I find it, you know, I, I do write poems to people who have died. To me, that really helps me kind of process that the fact that they ended. I mean, to me, that's just, I mean, there's something, of course, we humans grapple with um, all the time. And, um, but it helps me to, to write to them. So I have actually a lot of other poems to my mother, um, to my father who also died, to friends who have died. Um, it it just, it helps to talk through it, to talk to them, I guess, you know, but it's, it's a difficult thing to write about death. And it's probably the one human thing that we just don't understand. And mm. you know, I mean, I'm not saying anything profound here, but it's just so that that finality was just really, that's what really hit me. That was what hit my heart. Um, and then to think that her breath was still in the room, you know, was, was a real, that was so, I mean, it was, it's beautiful on the one hand, but to think that, to think that she was still with me somehow, um, but, you know, we just, you know, and of course it made me think about my own mortality, as I say in the poem. I, I wanted to say a word back to Zaina to, of of agreeing that I think this is one of the reasons we turn to poetry that it allows us to talk to people who aren't there. Yeah, um, yeah I, I totally agree with you. Um, I feel like poetry is kind of like a way that you can almost seance um, with those that you've lost, um, reach across that barrier and, and have a conversation that you otherwise might not be able to have. Um, and I, I think one of the reasons why I chose to put these poems together in this conversation um, is because there was the distance in your poem, Jennifer, right? And the closeness in your poem, Zaina, yet I saw the same similar moments happening in both poems that I thought was just really beautiful. Um, and so I thought we yeah. could talk about that a little bit. <laughs> well, also, it seems what Zaina was saying, the questioning everything moment, that, that the world becomes untethered, that yeah. sense cannot be made. So it's a liminal, mo it's a very interesting um, moment, liminal moment. Yeah. And Jennifer, the next question I have is for you, um, continuing on this idea of writing grief, um, could you speak about writing the elegy and what is your process for, for writing about loss? Do you have a process? Um, I don't have a process per se, but I have suffered a lot of grief in recent years. I know I'm not the only person um, during this pandemic. Um, and I am a writer who has a practice of writing. So those two happening simultaneously meant it was pretty inevitable that 
grief was going to work its way into my poetry. But you know, I'm I am I'm truly interested in elegy for the reasons that I was just saying to you while we well a minute ago that um, I do think one of poetry's superpowers um, is that it allows us to speak to the dead, to people who are not there, or to God, to you know, in the in the sense of prayer. Um, and I found that very comforting. Um, especially during the pandemic, as I said, which is when I wrote most of the book, mm. I was isolated, um, you know, in my house, a, a single woman. And I, it really, I never was more appreciative of the way that poetry acts as a kind of conversation that I was became very aware of how my poems were in conversation with other poems, you know, other poets, um, who had died writing in certain traditions, including elegy, and then also the the my own lost ones. Um, but you know, I also thought a lot during the writing of these poems about W.S. Merwin's famous one line poem called "Elegy." Um, mm -hmm. Who would I write it for? Is the whole poem, and there there is this sense as, as well to that. Um, that there are cautions about the, the elegy. I mean, for one, it never brings the person back. <laughs> um, well, I mean, it seems like it perhaps tries to preserve a person, but, you know, it cannot bring them back. Oh, I know what I was going to say, which is exactly a version of that, that I think the, the sort of, one thing that I also registered in writing poems was, um, not an anger, but a but a sort of a realization that that even if I wrote my heart out, wrote an, an elegy, it would not bring them back. It would also not uh, make them, you know, memorialize the way that Shakespeare claimed it would. That I don't believe in immortality through verse for the poet or the beloved, um, and it 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 ironically sort of writing all of these elegies made me more fiercely love and be grateful for the present moment, the material world and, and my life and what's left of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. Wow. Okay. I love that. That's great. Uh, I feel like that's a good transitional point for this next question for Zaina. Um, could you speak about writing displacement? Um, how does writing about the loss of place overlap or differ with writing about the loss of loved ones? Ooh, that's a, such an interesting question, uh, Danny. Um, I do write a lot about displacement and dispossession. Um, my parents were refugees, they were Palestinian refugees and um, they lost everything. They fled for their lives in 1948 mm -hmm. and moved from one country to the other. And then we ended up here in the United States. And so their whole, um, their, their whole feeling of exile was something that they took with them the, the, their entire lives. And I think one thing I wanted to write about for my parents is how that experience of exile, that experience of being a refugee, losing everything, worrying about everything in life, worrying about losing more, how that ages with you mm -hmm. um, as you grow older. Um, so to me, that was such, you know, it's a real, I grew up with this all the time, every day, you know, I would hear from my parents. And then I'm the immigrant. We immigrated to the United States when I was 10. So I kind of lost my childhood behind. I left, I guess I left it behind. I didn't lose it. Um, I, I left so much behind and I mourned um, a lot as well. So that's a whole, it's a, it's a different kind of grief. Um, losing so much of your history or, or or just not having that that security anymore um i don't know if it's a death if it's the same kind of grieving for death it's a different kind of grieving um but it's definitely a grieving and and i think you know 
I was reading something the other day about grief and how we think of it as a negative thing, you know, and that we think of it as um, it's something we have to get over and you know, we have to move on. Um, but, you know, if we, if we sit in our grief and then if, and it, 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 we, it, it transforms us, uh, if we express our grief, um, it's easy for me to say all these things and I try to do them, but, um, but I do think that, um, that grief is something that we need to, um, accept and, uh, have it be part of our lives. And then, you know, we move through it and that, and it's okay. Um, you kind of build up it. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, that was, that was a good answer. I, I liked it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was like, this is really thinking about all these things uh, on the spot. Um, but I, I mean, I, I do think about these things a lot and, uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Of course. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I'm going to ask you guys each a question about some themes I noticed in each of your collections. Uh, so going back to Jennifer, uh, you have several poems scattered throughout the book that have months as titles. Was there some reason behind that? Were they originally part of a series that delves into each month of the year? You include the months November, December, January, March, May, and August, transitioning through every season. In November, you bring the image of the heavy fallen grape starting to ferment on the ground. December is decisively placed in the dark unknown of an oncoming winter and the hesitancy to move into that season where you write, while well, something in me resists, something else enters the wild. January is in the thick of winter and the reader feels the cold despair in the lines, winter necessitates looking down. And I stared at nothing and heard my voice say, just wait a little longer. As a former Michigander, January really resonated with me. <laughs> is there a purpose to the placement and the movement of these months throughout the book? Um, Danny, that's such a, an amazing question. <laughs> Um, so yes, um, I'm, and I'm, I'm glad, I'm grateful that you paid careful attention, such careful attention to those poems. I, I did, I sort of invented this little genre for myself, this little assignment. It's not really a genre, but I had the idea that I would write, um, poems for e the months of for each month of the year. And the, and the only rule was that the title would be the month, but I would still say the month somewhere in the, in the poem. And that um, it had to be more than about the weather, obviously. <laughs> it had to be more than just description. It had to become a metaphysical um, existent, it, snapshot as well. And I was thinking, I don't know if you, if you all are familiar with um, the Très Riche Heure du Duc de Berry, which is an early prayer book, a uh, medieval um, manuscript that was made for a, a wealthy Duke who had the, the these very intricately illuminated pages for each month of the year and the prayers that went ac according to the seasons. I studied art history as an undergrad and I fell in love with this concept of, of, um, of moving, of paying attention to how one moves through time, in particular this cycle of a year. And there's a lot of um, uh, that happens also in in poet in the history of poetry with the pastoral, um, and you know other early early writing early genres. Um, Spencer has the beautiful Shepherd's Calendar, um, for instance. So in a way, I thought maybe I would do that because I am pretty upset. I think one of my greatest themes is time in poetry, um, and I'm I I think all the time about a line that Joseph Brodsky said when he was interviewed after winning the Nobel. And he said, all of my poems are about time, about mm -hmm. what time does to man. And I loved that. I mean, I would have used the word human, but um, I loved that because poetry is a kind of time. Meter is a keeping time. Um, and lots of the sort of ways we talk about the craft of poetry are related to measuring and, and them sort of like music, it occurs in time, but we occur in time too. And so um, I 
you know, I, I have a sort of closet feeling that poetry, one function of poetry for me at least is to help me record how I pass through time. But I should say it didn't work. I mean, I didn't take out, I didn't, I couldn't get a poem for every month, but um, maybe eventually I will. Um, so I only included the ones that really I thought made it as poems. Um, and they are more winter centric because I live in Rochester, New York. So you really got that part right. Um, and I, when I got to putting the book together, I, I was really, you know, of course the obvious thing it seemed to do would be to start with January and work through the calendar year, but I didn't like that at all. And I thought that would be too predictable. So I started with November and I have no idea why, but it at least, it at least let me end with, with May and August um, in the book. Well, so I, I kind of saw uh, with your starting in November, almost like an arch of grief kind of going through the months and ending in summer. Um, so just putting that out there, but. <laughs> no, that's very much true. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Zaina, I have a question about you, for you. Uh, you have so much food in your poems. <laughs> I ended up hungry once I was done reading your book. And it is funny because you even have a poem at the beginning of the book titled At the Workshop on Identity and Ethnicity, where you talk about being told to no longer write about food as a means to discuss identity and ethnicity. <laughs> and then you go on to do so throughout the book. Honestly, I love this irony. Could you speak a little bit about why you decided to include so much food in your book? Is it a way of reclaiming your homeland or creating a bridge by claiming the foods that nourished you there and continue to nourish you here? Mm, that's a great question. Um, well, I, I, um, I did write that poem after I attended a workshop for Arab American writers on identity and ethnicity. And the two presenters, this is a, several years ago, the two presenters really urged us not to write about food because they felt like if you write about food, then you're reducing your culture to, you know, hummus and tabbouli, right? So they they felt that it was important to, to think beyond that. And, and I've, I, I think completely differently. I feel like food is such an important part of our con uh, culture from growing it to the, you know, the act of, of preparing it to uh, celebrations that include food. Um, there's just so much around food. Uh, and in that poem, I say, you know, that there's, there's a special food that you make in Arab culture for when a baby's first tooth appears, you know, mm -hmm. there are special foods you make during Ramadan and Easter. There, you know, there are so many special kinds of foods. Um, and I have a poem in there that where food, you know, food's a great metaphor for so many things. Um, there's a, a cookbook author whom I love. Her name is Reem Kassiz. She's a Palestinian American as well. And she has this, uh, nine spice mix and she uses those that mix for a lot of her recipes in the book and I looked at all the nine spices in this uh, mix and they're they come from all over the world you know and together they are giving a Palestinian flavor and it was so I wrote this poem about how it's like a, a you know all this th these these um so there's support from all over the world that together comes for the Palestinians, right? I mean, you you, you can take this uh, poem any way you want. It's also just a fun poem. But but I think so, the, the point is that um, food can be a metaphor for so much as well. Um, so, and, you know, food is memory of, of your childhood and, and, you know, um, there's so much in terms of memory and food. Um, and, and that's, you know, I think of my mother in the kitchen. She spent so much time in the kitchen. So to me, her preparation of food is so, was so pivotal in my childhood, right? So, yeah. Well, I think all that really came through. Um, I know I had some 
a lot of different emotional reactions to the different foods, the different contexts, um, which I thought was really interesting how that changed throughout the book um, and left me very hungry. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so as we wrap up this conversation, I want to end with some questions on craft for you both. Um, and you can, whoever has the answer first can go. <laughs> so do you have any advice to anyone watching this conversation about how to structure a book? What thought process went behind the structuring of each of these books? Well, I had a hard time structuring my book um, because I I didn't have a theme that carried throughout. Maybe maybe the food thing <laughs> would have been one way, but I, there are so many other poems. I like to write about so many different things. I really, you know, my hat's off to poets who have a theme for the entire book. I think it's beautiful, but I haven't been able to do that. So to me, I had to think of, you know, I ended up with three buckets really of themes or general themes uh, for the book. So it's in three sections. Um, so, you know, the middle section is about war and displacement. The first section is more about interpersonal relationships. And the third section was sort of about wondrous things. That's kind of how I like to think of it. It has comets and, you know, stars, and it has trees and rivers and uh, all sorts of sort of wondering kinds of things. So it was not easy to put together. I don't think, uh, I can't say that it was, it was an easy thing for me, but, um, but I think uh, looking at poems, uh, you know, that speak to each other sometimes as, as a way to think about it, like one after the other, if maybe they could be on very completely different themes, but there is some thread that, that pulls them together. I think that's a really helpful thing to think about. Awesome. Did you have a similar experience, Jennifer? Or um, yeah, I, I really agree that it's it's hard to structure books. I think that there are some poets who write books and poems and some poets who write books of poems. And I'm definitely a poet who writes poems. Yeah. Um, I have some friends who, you know, they'll write like three poems and they know they're writing a book of poems. And I, I do not do that. I mean, I think for me, my rational mind um, or organ is the least sophisticated part of me is the least intelligent and interesting. Um, so I try to make it go away as much as possible. And I, in my case, I just write a poem one at a time and I tell myself I'm never making a book. And only when I really have a lot of them do I then realize I am writing a book um, because part of the creative process for me also is that I cannot tell you what I am doing until long after I've done it. Um, and that's what ordering a book kind of is, is organizing the thinking that your subconscious mind has been doing in fits and starts and in various poems over a period of time. Um, I mean, for me, I thought that my organizing my first book would be the hardest and it was in four sections. And I thought, okay, now that I've got experience, you know, it won't be so hard. But each book I've organized completely differently. The third, the second book had three sections. My the second book, the third book had two sections, and this book has no sections. It's just one long sweep. So I think maybe I'm getting more, maybe I'm getting better at hanging poems next to each other, like Zaina's saying, mm -hmm. or maybe my subconscious mind is is writing them in such a way that they know how to click together better. I'm not sure, but um, I have no idea if I write a fifth book, how it will look or what it will be about. <laughs> so my advice is, is good luck. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I, I'm in the same camp as both of you where it's just kind of like, who knows how this is going to come together, but hopefully it will. <laughs> Yeah, I like that. Um, okay, so here's the final question for any curious attendees out there. Who are your poetic or artistic influences? And do you have any book recommendations of your favorite recent reads, either poetry or prose? Well, um, you know, I have to say that all along, um, Naomi Shehab Nye has just been a, a, a North Star kind of for me. Uh, she just writes so beautifully and 
she really captures that sort of the Arab American and the Palestinian American experience for me, and much more than that. But it in the beginning, when I started writing, it was almost like I could see she was a model for me and to me. So that's been really a beautiful way to think uh, and, and beautiful poetry to look at. Um, you know, I I do read I do read Arabic, and um, I've read um, you know some of the Arab poets, and that um, has helped me a lot to look at my heritage and look at the themes. Um, and um, so, you know, the the more the more famous traditional, you know, Mahmoud Darwish and Taha Muhammad Ali. But there are some wonderful new Arab authors in translation, and I I really urge people to read, you know, poetry in translation if you can't read Arabic or any language, really. But I think it's really important for people to to read poems in translation. Um, There are two uh, Palestinian poets who are really wonderful, and I I recommend... um, uh, one is named Najwan Darwish, D-A-R-W-I-S-H. He's not related, actually, to Mahmoud Darwish, um, but he has has is kind of a, a up and count. Well, he's already he's already there, but uh, he does beautiful work. And then Maya Abu Al Hayat, um, whom with whom we read together, Danny, uh, and she has uh, some lovely poems, uh, a book of poems that's been translated by Fadi Juda. So. I, I, those would be my recommendations. I mean, there are so many others, of course. That's a good starting point. I like that list. <laughs> um, Danny, that question is very hard for me because I um, am the director of the Breadloaf Writers Conferences, as you uh-huh. as you mentioned in my intro. And because of that, I read voluminously um, the new books out there. And I can think of many, but I don't want to single any out, okay. especially since I'm actually here at Bread Love right now. I'm, <laughs> I won't be popular in doing so. But I want to, I guess I want to say two things in a way that's sort of perversely answering your question, um, which is, one is, um, I feel like today, this is not the, the case when I was a younger poet coming up, but I feel like today we tend to read more contemporary than we do reading back now. So mm-hmm. I find it, I used to, when I would teach a poetry workshop, only teach new books just out because I wanted students to know that poets were alive and they were doing interesting things and they were like us. Now I feel like they are all following them already on social media. They know every, they know more than I do sometimes. Um, and so I feel like I can help them by encourage, helping them go back and read Elizabeth Bishop or T.S. Eliot. My students don't know the love song of Jailford Proof Rock now. So um, I sort of have started assigning more course, more texts that are actually a little older and trying to help students have access to that um, who might not otherwise. But when you ask about who sort of really influenced me, I would just say one place I might start, I like to send people to is contemporary Polish poetry, which has been a huge influence um, on my own work. Um, And particularly poets like Adam Zagajewski um, and um, Czesław Miłosz and Zbigniew Herbert and Wisława Szymborska. Um, And then, they are great models for um, how poems can also be vessels of history as well as lyrics. Awesome. That was a very fair way to answer. I appreciated it. (laughs) And good recommendations uh, in terms of, you know, your, your influences. So Um, thank you both for going through this conversation with me um, and to discuss your, your gorgeous books. I want to encourage everyone to go out and support poets by buying their books and attending readings. Um, And I want to thank everyone for for watching this conversation and uh, attending Fall for the Book in their 25th year. So thank you all. Thank you, Danny. Thank Thank you you so much. It's really lovely. Thank you.